All right. So now you get to hear more about Libby and a little bit more information about how we um, will eventually get to the field investigation part, but we'll talk a little bit about where we started and kind of how we got to where we are now. All right, let me make sure. Okay. So our learning objectives are to describe how to phase work to better inform risk characterization through understanding site characterization. Just kind of getting at what that exercise that we just did is. Learning how to use the event tree to um, understand your uncertainties and kind of using that to fill data gaps and build your, if you're doing a field investigation plan or any type of scoping. Uh, I usually stop and take a look at the event tree to, uh, to help me scope anything that I'm doing. And recognize how field mapping can be used to inform drilling and invasive investigations. So we'll go over a little bit of the project background um, the history of the left abutment, I'll, you've heard some of that already. Go over our issue evaluation study and the different um, phases that we've had in that, and go over um, some conclusions and any questions you might have. All right, so getting into project background. So where is Libby? Libby is in northwestern Montana. You can see here's the dam. Um, it's 222 miles upstream of the Kootenai and Columbia River confluence. The reservoir is called Lake Kukanusa, which is actually a pretty cool name how they, they did it. Uh, the beginning is Ku for Kootenai, Can for Canada, and then USA. So Lake Kukanusa, because the reservoir extends um, into Canada, and there's a, a treaty actually in place for, um, for this project. So, and also downstream of the dam, the river flows into Idaho and Canada before coming back into the U.S. further downstream. Construction was it from 1967 and finished in 1973 with the powerhouse that followed. So this is just uh, kind of familiarizing yourself with where things are in the dam. One thing we didn't talk about in that last exercise is what DS stands for, and it's the coolest name of a slide. It, uh, it's the Dirty Shame slide for the dirty shame fault. So the plus 122 or plus anything is the, the offset from that dirty shame uh, fault itself, which is there. It's a pretty, pretty cool name for geology. Uh, that, that's over here on the left abutment. You have the spillway here, a powerhouse. This does generate power. The visitor center is up here on the right abutment um, and some administration buildings down here at the bottom. Here's just showing a section and profile of the dam. We won't spend much time on here, but just pointing out a couple of interesting features on this project are um, here. This was an interesting find during the first round of SQRA that we had. Um, was So it's a big concrete dam. It's obvious you show up, you can see it. It's, it's right there. Um, but then you walk around in the visitor center parking lot, not really realizing that that's also the dam. So there are monoliths that are buried beneath the parking lot with uh, 11 feet of common fill above them. So it was something interesting in looking at internal erosion on a concrete dam um, that we had to, to go through as well that we, when we first took on the project, weren't exactly expecting uh, some of those soil <laughs> modes on a concrete dam, but there is soil. All right. All right, so some dam operations. It's a really interesting project. Um, the operations are really complex, which I tell everybody that listens to me about this project, I talk about it often, is that everything about this project is complicated, including the operations. So this here is um, the history of the, the pool data since construction. Um, and we, kind of a cool thing is that they switched operations in the early 2000s, so that played into kind of how we build our loading. Um, we do stage duration for this, how long is the pool at a certain level at any given time of the year, more than the stage frequency curve we've been looking at in our, um, in our exercise. Um, and they just, they, they changed some operations to uh, be able to address some fish and wildlife concerns and some environmental concerns. And they have this selective withdrawal system where they can uh, choose the temperature of water based on the depth of the pool for the, uh, different times of the year based on what fish and other environmental factors are needed at this project. So it takes a lot into consideration, which makes it a little complicated, but super interesting. 
All right, so this is just showing uh, the regional geology of the area. It's a northwest southwest uh, trending fault, fold belt consisting of old metamorphic rock um, with some it's primarily argillite with some interbedded quartzites and uh, a little bit of limestone, but not really much. But it caused these large structural um, and folding related systems that we're seeing in these wedges. So that, that's really important for what we evaluated and what we are still evaluating. So touching on seismic hazards a little bit, um, seismicity in this area is important for this failure. So we have to take that into consideration and, and how our seismic loading is in northwestern Montana. Um, we didn't do a site specific hazard analysis for seismic here, but we we did look at some regional ones and some local ones and used USGS data to inform our um, our loading for seismic hazards. And the one uh, with USGS data, the one in ten thousand is about 0.26 g um, for our, kind of our peak ground acceleration. All right, so the history of the left abutment, we'll go through this a little fast because you've seen some of this already, but there's this presence of this uh, geologic structure on the left valley wall that was recognized really early on in the investigation of the site. So they did know about this. They actually built physical models to be able to look and see how this type of structure really, like Todd was saying, at the dam and upstream and what that might, um, what, what that might effect on the dam width. But we have these mapped rib structures, so they're kind of ribs in, in the fact that this is the lake here, here's the dam. You have these four rib structures that were mapped. Um, these might have been pre-construction or during construction, I can't recall, uh, early on in, in the phase of this um, project. And so you can see they're rather large, and for reference, this little um, subset area that's the one that failed during construction so the wedges that we're looking at are really large comparison to what we've seen happen shallow shallowly with the, the wedge um so this is uh, just showing the same thing for that construction slide so i won't spend much time here either but just that this really played into understanding the uh, geometry of the wedge out there and looking at a larger one. So this shallow wedge is really well studied. Um, they have instrumentation on it. They're monitoring it. It's not a dam safety concern. Uh, really the larger wedge that we we were talking about and that we'll talk about is what we are, what we've been concerned about. So getting into the issue evaluation study. So these are the four failure modes that we've been evaluating. Um, we're going to focus on PFM4, but PFM1 is overtopping. Overtopping is a little interesting because we have that common fill, that soil um, that's 11 feet over on the right abutment. That kind of causes a double breach scenario where you, you can lose the soil, but you can also lose the rock. And so consequences for those two things are different. Uh, PFM4, we're going to talk about this more. PFM5 is a rock slide induced wave that overtops the dam. So that's what the focus really was prior to construction, during construction, especially after that shallow wedge failed. Um, like I said, physical models were built with the waterways. Experimental station, I think, is what West stands for. Jamie, you're green. Um, they built models for this, which is pretty neat to see. Um, and then PFM38 is the concentrated leak erosion through the fill material on the right about that. All right, so for PFM4, this was our initial uh, event tree. This, we've, we've done it in SQRA. This is us going into our first round of QRAs. Heads up, we've had two now, so it's going to evolve from here. But I'm going to just walk through this a little bit um, to give you some background on what each node really is. So for node one, it's the flaw. It's a, a large rock wedge positioned beneath and along the slope of the left abutment of the dam. Does that exist? Is there geometry in that wedge for a flaw or a rock wedge to exist? Node two, so right here, we put our loading condition aside from our stage duration. So this is pool here. Pool fluctuates about uh, 100, 120 feet throughout the year. So that is just input here, 
Um, we don't really have to make a selection other than what pools we're looking at within that, but they're all normal pool. Um, and then loading conditions. So what is that seismic event and what are those pore pressures that we need to have to cause any issues? And what are those thresholds? Node three is initiation. So initiation of the, the wedge is, this is probably the most complicated node um, that we've spent a lot of time on and a lot of uncertainty on. So this wedge that we're looking at, the, the large wedge, doesn't daylight. So there's no toe at the surface like there was when we, when we built that highway, we cut out the toe and it failed. Uh, the, the wedge doesn't, the, based on how steeply dipping things are, it doesn't daylight at the surface. So we have to have something that causes it to rupture or kick out along a discontinuity. So we have to evaluate um, what, what, what kind of seismic event might cause that. And do we even have something to kick out on, or does it have to kick out through intact rock? And we have these stress hypotheses that were developed during construction um, from a board of consultants. They come up with these different um, hypotheses on how this could occur. And, uh, and so we use those to start with. And so looking, we looked at different situations and scenarios of a kick out along a discontinuity or through that intact rock. We didn't want to miss either. So, um, so that's, that's why we evaluated both. Node four is progression. So here, really continuation progression. Filter here isn't, um, isn't really applicable in continuation, but this, so this to progress, monoliths have to be undermined, causing instability. So what's the probability that we undermine the dam monoliths enough to cause them to be unstable? Intervention is our next node. Um, this is a rapid failure. There's really no means for intervention. We still carry it, but there's there's really not much. We don't think we can do much to really intervene on this failure mode specifically. And the last note is breach, and that's so the monolith, monoliths were undermined and um, unstable in the last node, and this is them actually mobilizing and moving, resulting in an uncontrolled release. So there's been a, a history of sliding within the reservoir. So this is kind of getting at our flaw. Um, it's really important to understand that and understand the size of these wedges that have failed historically. They were very similar to the, the volume that we are looking at in this failure mode. So that kind of gave us some confidence in what we were looking at, that this isn't just you know something that we think could happen. It's actually happened before. But there is a lot of uncertainty with how those failed and um, how those resulted in a slide. What initiated those? We, we don't have that. These are prehistoric slides, but you can see that they're, they're pretty large. So there's this one here. So this is the prehistoric slide 925 and then 930. 930, they actually have debris mapped up the other slope. So we know that it failed quickly and that there was a lot of volume because it, it ran up the other slope and it is um, still visible. So we reviewed in, in the first round of quantitative risk assessment, we reviewed and compiled, we kind of did this as a more in-depth desk study. So the SQRA was, um, you know, the information you had on a limited um, amount of time and resources to be able to do that. And the second, you know, phase and in going into the IS, we were able to review, compile, digitize as much information as we, can, as we could to help inform our flaw and our initiation. We use construction photos through this. So um, kind of digging more through, there's a lot of information. It's almost overwhelming how much information there is. So we took some time, looked through construction photos and tried to do kind of an analysis from that as much as we could while things were excavated and you could still see them. We did, um, we did some, Three point outcrop pattern mapping. Uh, this was a fun exercise. <laughs> so this is some scanned in. I got my uh, what's it called? The uh, paper um, translucent paper field mapping uh, to do some outcrop pattern mapping to kind of figure out what does our wedge look like from the information that we currently have. Where does it kick out? So we kind of hypothesized where we thought we could kick out or where we needed to kick out to be concerned. 
And then we also looked at depths, uh, potential depths of some of those prehistoric slides to develop a depth that we thought we might need for this failure. So this is kind of showing um, a, a little bit of a cleaner version of that results of kind of compiling all of that and that outcrop pot pattern mapping. So here's the conceptual wedge that we developed um, in, in the quantitative risk assessment. You can see kind of here, uh, taking into consideration, we've already lost part of this wedge from that construction failure. And then just visualizing, being able to show this and visualize it because it's very complicated. Todd has been huge in helping um, explain this and show figures for this. Um, so we have here shown a monolith, so reference, monolith 47 is the last monolith up here. And um, going down, you can see 38, 43 here. And those are what these sections are showing here. So you can kind of see what we're undermining on each uh, for the wedge under each of these monoliths. And here's just a profile of you looking upstream. So here's that wedge where that kick out point is here. And this was extremely helpful when we had to brief this, um, being able to explain something that we spent months <laughs> looking at in a, a couple of slides. I think, you know, Susie mentioned that sometimes we only get a couple of slides to be able to prove our point or build our case. So from that, after we kind of combined all of that, um, we still had some uncertainty that we thought we needed to address. Primarily that there was a lot of um, information upstream of the dam, but downstream, at the dam and downstream that we had a lot of uncertainty and really wanted to um, kind of focus in on what else could help us inform the probability of this failure. So we put together scope to move on from kind of a first phase into a second phase, which was really building in our field investigation program, which we, we um, did some geologic mapping as we talked about. We'll talk about that a little more. We did a LIDAR survey. We did some drilling and um, you can see we did some optical and acoustical borehole televiewers. I know some people have already talked about that. I agree that you should always do that anytime you're drilling rock. We did packer testing, downhole geophysics, installed some piezometers. There was a lot of uncertainty about uh, groundwater here or even pore pressure, not just groundwater, but pore pressure. There wasn't any instrumentation, so we had to make some assumptions based on what we saw and what we read, but, um, but nothing to really measure that. And then we did a 3D geostructural stability analysis that we're still working on. So this is still an ongoing project. But what we did is we wanted to show kind of what uncertainty we had, what, what did we think we could fill gaps in, and how could it be meaningful for the failure mode. So we kind of identified, okay, we have a lot of uncertainty in general, but what do we want to focus on for this failure mode? So looking at the flaw, initiation, loading, like stepping through the event tree and kind of figuring out what could we do to reduce some of that uncertainty, and where did we have the most uncertainty that we thought we could, within reason, reduce. Um, within our scope. So the focus of the, the kind of this portion will be on the mapping and drilling, but just wanted to mention, you know, there's a bit more than that. All right, so I'm gonna ask a question. Um, you might, if you have, if you have this up on your, your screen, you're gonna be a step ahead, but what nodes on the tree, event tree might mapping influence? Any ideas? Somebody want to throw one one note out? Sure. Note one. The flaw. Yeah. So we thought that mapping would inform node one the flaw. Does the flaw exist and where is its location? And node three initiation. So what's the continuity and persistence of those joint sets, the A joint, Z joint, which was, that's what it was classified prior to our field mapping exercise. So we really wanted to reduce the uncertainty on that and have a better, not just have a conceptual wedge or a hypothetical wedge that we kind of knew it, where it existed, but not exactly sure. We wanted to get out and map that. So we used this as our base map. We kind of divided it up. This is an ortho photo um, that, 
is pretty good resolution that we were able to then break into sections and we went out and um, kind of mapped each each section within that. We started along the road cut, so that's kind of where we focused first. Um, we had different photos for that. We went out early, took some photos, and then um, had those printed out to be able to, to map on. And it guided us really through the rest of the mapping. So starting at that road cut, we discovered things that um, kind of really focused the rest of the week or the rest of the few days that we had to be able to do that. So before we went into the field, we compiled and pulled all the data together so we could not just show up, but show up with a plan or at least some sort of plan to be able to focus what we had. We mapped some things that we thought we saw in the photo and with data that we had, put those on the map to make sure we could confirm that those were there or better characterize anything that was out there and identify any features ahead of time. So we identified lower and upper road cuts, so access along the dam and construction access upslope. So we were able to find in some of this, we weren't sure um, how, how to go about some things, but we were able to find some old construction roads to really get around the different parts of the site. Um, we did have to go upslope here and there, but there were some easier ways to get through. We, um, we planned to have LIDAR prior to going into the field. Um, it didn't happen, but we were still able to adapt. So sometimes you plan for things and want things and, and you do the best with the information that you have. All right, so it's also important to have the naming convention. Todd talked about this in his mapping presentation, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but um, just so everybody's talking about the same thing when you're out there and mapping the same thing, so that way you don't get back and say, well, I called it this, you called it that. What is it actually called? You have a mapping convention, a naming convention on how you're going to label and um, move things forward. So shortly after getting into the field, uh, for mapping, like I said, we it had been previously characterized as these side planes were characterized as joint sets. And in our previous solicitation, we thought, well, how continuous are joints? You know, maybe they're not continuous, maybe they are. Um, it's hard to say. But we quickly realized that they were actually misclassified originally and were shear zones or splays instead, which speaks to continuity a lot differently than a joint set might. And that really focused us. That's why I said the, the road cut mapping really helped us focus in on, um, on the rest of the, the exercise or the rest of the mapping because we knew what to look for. So we needed to kind of, we saw it at the road cut, we saw these, these shear zones. Did they trace upstream or did they trace upslope, I'm sorry, and downslope? So we, we really focused the rest of that um, effort on there. We know those bedding planes exist. There, there wasn't as much uncertainty with that. Um, we also found, as you saw in the exercise, these joint set or these shear um, shear planes or side side shears were right, kind of regularly, consistently placed along the slope. So we we kept we kept going downstream, and you know every. Um, I think it was about 50 -ish feet, maybe, give or take, uh, you saw these. So, um, as we said before, it's not, it, we looked for a lot of rock, rock, but we paid attention to other features. So the shear wasn't as um, easily identifiable at the surface as it was on that road cut. So you look for other features like the depression, um, upslope, kind of, that kind of tells us something that something is a weaker, weaker area or um, not as high strength, linear depressions, and kind of just following that through. So they weren't consistently mapped across the surface, but we, we used what we could and weathered rock to in indicate uh, continuity. It was actually really, um, <laughs> we climbed to the top of the slope, and then once we got up there, we took a break. And then we looked across the valley because it's a beautiful area <laughs> and a really cool dam. And then we realized that these are on the right side of the valley as well. 
So then that really kind of opened our eyes that this is likely continuous. These are um, major features um, at this area. So that kind of taking that <laughs> taking that break and looking elsewhere. I'll I'll speed up. <laughs> By looking elsewhere, we um, we found really good information. Uh, we also looked for other features, kickout areas. So it wasn't just focused on those two uh, those two planes, but looking for uh, there's the ramp fault that was mapped during construction. There's adits inside of the dam that you can actually see this in. Um, and then we looked for those at the surface, anything that might influence our geometry um, and information that we'd seen previously, we tried to map while we were out there. So these are just some examples of our products coming out of the mapping. Um, so it's a lot of information, but kind of all focusing on things that would inform our risk driver, including um, any presence of seepage or, or water or staining. So we developed a geologic map with the features that were mapped in the field. This was taken and then used to target for drilling um, in our drilling program, as you all know. And so we had, prior to going out, we had identified some rough locations for borings, but this really allowed us to kind of refine what we thought we were going to do with what we found in the field and um, collect that data and the subsurface in that drilling program. So here are some key findings. I'm not gonna go through all these in, in sake of time, but um, we kind of talked through all of these, you know, looking at different surfaces, looking for not just things that are there, but cast or things that may have been plucked out already. Um, looking for infilling of any discontinuities in, in groundwater and, and whatnot. So getting into the drilling investigation, what nodes in the event tree does drilling impact? Anybody else that doesn't know the answer? <laughs> All right, just just throw one out there. Anybody? Okay, thank you. Yeah, so <laughs> um, it really affects a lot of the nodes in the event tree. Node one, the flaw, similar to mapping, also informs loading, so seismic data, core pressure data from the uh, PZs and packer testing. Initiation, so what's the continuity of that joint set or those shear, um, shear planes? And then um, model with instability, understanding the geometry of the wedge informed the structural analysis. All right, so with that, you can see where, so you saw the road cut uh, version of where we, we did that. That's here. Oh, yes, it's here. So we actually did borings, kind of, we did one here at the top. Um, there was an old construction road that actually allowed us to get the rig up to the top um, and drill here. We drilled one up the road. We drilled one along this slope um, as well. That's where that ramp fault comes. So that ramp fault kind of traces through here. So we wanted to see if we could get any information there. And then kind of the lower slope was harder to map. Um, there was a lot of talus and a lot of colluvium. So we couldn't trace the shear in this lower part of the slope. So we wanted to try to see if we could identify anything here. Uh, the parking lot area, so this is a big, uh, this was the easiest access to get to. Um, so we had a, a couple of borings there to kind of try to see if the, that wedge geometry showed up at the uh, toe. And then also we did a boring out to try to kind of understand that kick out. Is there that discontinuity we talked about and, um, and how deep might it be? You can see some of these through here. So we took that map that was developed from mapping and plotted sections and, and targeted borings. So you can see here, so these are some of the sketches Todd was talking about. Where we kind of messed around with this a lot. We went through and said, okay, do we wanna do vertical? Are there some angles? What angle do we wanna go at for some of these? How deep do we wanna go? What's our target? All right, thank you. Um, this is kind of a visual of just showing how, where the rig was on the slope. Um, so that the rig at the top slope was up here. Our road, uh, road boring was here. Kind of our mid slope boring was here. You can see that rig up there standing down here, taking a picture up. 
You can see that up on the slope. And then down here in this parking lot area, we did three borings. These are just some photos of that, that drilling program. So this is up on that, that mid slope area where that ramp fault is. You can see um, we did an angle boring there. The rig coming off of that slope is kind of neat. Um, this was in November, December. So that's a fun time in Montana to drill. I'm a little cold some days, but it wasn't that bad. Uh, and then we had the drilling this hole here, we were drilling and then we got down, I think this hole was 200 feet. We got down to 100 feet, needed to take a break, start cleaning some things out, and then um, water started flowing. So we hit artesian conditions, um, which made some things interesting. Ultimately, there weren't any concerns, so we continued drilling. We did, this is actually really, really helpful. We did daily logs in the field. Um, whoever was doing the oversight, we kind of shared that responsibility. Um, the geologist in Seattle, this is a Seattle district project, and um, they were out there for a majority of the time. And um, she was, she, she's an awesome geologist who uh, <laughs> kind of started the, the daily logs, kind of talking about what happened that day, what decisions were made, what uncertainties there were, um, any concerns with anything, and then shared that back to the team, through the rest of the team who wasn't in the field. And then, you know, when she left the field and, and I took over, somebody else took over, and we did the same, so it was kind of good communication throughout the field investigation. Um, you don't get a lot of service or any service at the project, so having those every day at the end of the day was really helpful to be able to, you know, have some input into what was happening and where we were doing testing and whatnot. So the cool, I think the coolest part is that, so because we did mapping, we just started finding some of the things we were looking for in our borings, um, which doesn't always happen. It's very exciting when, you know, when your, your things come out and it's the Z shear, you find it, um, you know, roughly around where you thought you might. Didn't always happen. There were a couple of borings that didn't quite show up things and, and that's in that where there's wider uncertainty. So, you know, we may have missed it or it may have been, you know, more um, a, a tighter portion of, of the, the shear and maybe that it wasn't as wide, widely um, visible as it was, you know, at the surface. But, um, but essentially what we interpreted, we started to find, which was really cool, the optical and acoustical logs were really beneficial when we started doing data analysis and it made it easier to process the data in the end. Here's just another, another example. This is the bedding shear um, that we found, the DS plus 80 bedding shear in one of our borings. Just going to go through a couple here just showing some examples of those features in the subsurface and um, like I said it's pretty neat. Another bedding shear. I was probably way too excited every time things came up and you could see them but um, I love this project so. And this is kind of the general product at the end that we had. So these were our logs we were able to kind of compile um, or the, the contractor we work with was able to compile this and then we were able to easily take this and use it and evaluate um, different properties. So the updated QRA. Um, so there's been a lot of effort that's gone into each node of the event tree. Uh, we've really tried to dig in and understand different parts of the nodes and inform those. So our event tree kind of evolved into the second QRA. Um, really the biggest changes are, are uh, before we were, we were evaluating poor pressure as a loading condition as well. We've since removed that and talked about it a little bit more qualitatively because the data is limited. Um, but we have our stage duration and seismic. We have our flaw. And because there was still some uncertainty in the kickout, we didn't see anything that was obvious for a kickout discontinuity. So we, and the probabilities of initiation along a discontinuity or initiation along uh, intact or through intact rock are very different. So we didn't feel like we could just focus on one because the probability of initiation through a discontinuity is much higher, much less likely. We didn't find anything. Um, but kick out through intact rock is much lower, 
still that chance that it exists because we have limited data. So what we did is we broke out our node two into to a weight. So we simulated our probability that a discontinuity existed. And the rest would be weighted towards that rock mass. And from there, we could estimate our initiation, our trigger um, of this happening based on those scenarios and our calculations would take that into consideration. Uh, the rest of our event tree stayed the same. Um, obviously, we had a little bit more information to go into that. But I um, also want to note that looking at multiple seismic events, so this is, um, this is one set of branches. We actually have multiple of these at different seismic events. So it's really complicated, um, but pretty cool, pretty cool way to go about it. All right, and from that, we were able, um, from, we, we did collect piezometer data. It was still limited. You know, we did the analysis about a year after some of these had been installed, uh, getting the lab testing results back for drilling and whatnot. So we, we took the data that we did have for piezometers and then some historical data and developed a groundwater uh, map, which we didn't have previously. We looked at different variations of the wedge, what was most critical. Um, one kind of stopping at the top of the road, that's not really uh, going to impact the dam. One at that ramp fault, and then one at the, the bottom and, and that kick out through uh, discontinuity or intact rock. We ultimately decided to go with this last wedge as a worst case scenario. Um, and really, there's question if, if this has enough driving force to kick out here and cause any displacement. So we moved forward with that larger wedge. Um, we did some hand calculations and so we did a lot of uh, different varieties of uh, stability analysis. It's a busy slide here, but just kind of showing the complexities and what all went into it. Um, looking at, you know, kicking out through here, what are, uh, where's the groundwater, what is our strength, what's the data, and we even did some sensitivity on our inputs into that and using different programs. Um, we did, here we have all the data from the borings. We did um, compile those. We, we classified different features, discontinuities as significant, highly significant, moderate, or low, and then tried to map some significant features on a stereo net. And it helped us focus in on that kick out. So we were looking for things kind of in this larger thing and, and kind of honing down to this circle, looking for are there any discontinuities in this area that we should be concerned about? Because this is kind of where we're looking, the geometry we're looking at, um, and the angles that we're looking at. And fortunately, nothing, nothing really jumped out as um, being present in that boring that we did have. We did some assessment of the rock wedge, the rock mass and the passive wedge or that kick out area. So we used those stress hypotheses again from the um, board of consultants. We looked, we compiled all of our data, looked at RMR, um, some cohesion and friction, and tried to um, just see if there was anything that popped out to us. But really, um, there was a lot of good quality rock um, with relatively high shear strength. Like I said, we used multiple analyses to validate our uh, geostructural vector analysis. So no, no tool was perfect or has been perfect. Um, so we've tried to use a few different things to do sensitivity and validate what we did do. So we've used some commercial software like our S2 um, Swedge and tried to, you know, make sure what we were doing was kind of consistent overall. Um, to, to help us elicit that initiation and come up with some factors of safety and what might be those thresholds. And here's just some, um, some calculations that went into that vector analysis. These are all just, uh, this is just a summary table of not extensive, but it's, it's um, kind of how we racked and stacked things. We looked at multiple cases, different scenarios, different models, um, different inputs to try to figure out what our what case we were going to elicit on for each. So just showing that we, you know, we spent a lot of time to try to do what, the best that we could on our estimates with the data and tools that we had. So um, knowledge check, um, how can you use mapping to inform risk at a project?
This one should be easy. Yes, thank you. All right. So conclusions and key takeaways. So we did, we started, uh, we did a scaled approach. We started with a desktop study to really understand what data we did have, where our data gaps were, rather than just going right out into the field and collecting that. Um, our field mapping and drilling effort was extremely beneficial and successful. We determined joints were shears and identified the wedge geometry more, um, more refined than our conceptual um, model before. Allowed for informed and successful drilling program and characterized strengths of planes and rock mass. We did utilize the historic data as well where we could. But, um, having some on our wedge itself was really helpful. We collaborated and communicated with a contract, the contractor who did the drilling and, uh, and the GDR for this. So we actually, when we were field mapping, we met them in the field to do a pre-bid pre site visit to kind of walk through everything that we were looking for. And it was really helpful. This site is challenging and, and um, some challenging access. So it was good to have them out there. Um, we, we didn't have any single method that we could use to calculate the stresses accurately. So we used multiple methods. And we have completed our updated QRA for PFM4 using all of this. We're still working through the process of um, kind of calculating things and, uh, and um, working through that. So it's, like I said, it's a little bit of a, a challenging project. I don't want to that, that last part very, very quickly, but are there any questions? Todd, do you have anything to add? No, I don't think so. You did a good job. The, the, the end product of having a consultant who did the work and a driller out on site um, and it takes a store of four and um, then the be collaborative and community is I'm hoping I'm hoping we can do it that way more often. That actually saves time effort money. Yeah, that was really helpful. It's been a successful. Yep, go ahead. Did budget play a role in your help with your final boring location and number? Well, um, yes, and yeah, I mean, there's always a budget, but we justified what we could or what we thought we did what we thought was justified to fill those data gaps. Of course, we would love looking back, would I have liked a couple more borings? Of course, especially in that kick out. Um, this is actually one of Susie's projects she manages, so she's our program manager for this project, so she hears about it a lot. <laughs> yeah, I force people to listen to me talk about it. Um, but it's, yeah, I mean, that's always a factor, but I think we made the case, we built the case that things needed to be looked at and done, and the way we did it, we were able to justify what we, what we did. Did you mention that you're going bringing this back to the vertical team soon? Not yet. So, yeah, we're, so we're working, I'm working on calculations on this because the calculations aren't straightforward for this project, and, and none of them are. So we actually have a new software that we are, see some really smart people at RMC are developing and so we're learning how to use that with the team and um, once we have the calculations final and we're kind of where we know where we're at we'll be briefing the vertical team uh, soon so after every risk assessment we do these vertical team briefs with our senior leaders and uh, make sure that they agree with what we've done and if they have further questions or concerns they'll direct us to go do more or they'll, um, we'll kind of work through that process and, and finalize a report. Yeah. Um, first one, why didn't you go with the use of the drill group? Was that budget or? Uh, no. I think there's, this is a very challenging um, drilling program. We were doing angled borings. Um, there aren't a lot of use of drill rigs. I think there might be one that does uh, angle borings. It was brand new to that team and we just, we didn't know if it was gonna be there in, in time and if they'd have the experience with it yet to get the data that we needed. So we didn't want to go that route for this project. And one more, um, how difficult would then uh, mapping have been if you didn't have your eyes to you know, like, do you things differently if you didn't have that? I don't think so. I think the Abbott's um, confirmed some of the ramp fault, but we saw it at the surface. It was very well mapped in construction. 
So it was helpful to see it inside. It didn't really, um, you didn't see the shear zone through there that we were looking for. That, the feel, like being on the ground, that is cool, but being on the, on the ground was the biggest benefit. Do you think that you all would have honed in on this failure mode if you had not had that slide during construction, the dirty shame slide? I don't think so, personally. I think, so this is one that the shallow slide's been looked at a ton. Like I said, the, the wave overtopping the dam has been looked at a lot. This failure mode is something that's been recommended for decades for reports, because like Todd said, it's been really well studied. It's talked about a lot. Uh, and there was just never really the mechanism to be able to take the time to do that and have the team to do that. And that's what our risk process does. So um, this was the opportunity to do that. But I don't think, I don't personally, I don't know if it would have been as concerning if that didn't happen. I don't know, Todd, do you have any thoughts? No? Oh, no, I agree. I agree. Uh, 1971 slide has been sometimes documented and studied the feature. Well, it's kind of a textbook slide, a wedge failure too. It's in textbooks. We still might have seen it because of the previous part of slides on screen. Yeah. So, in the structure, it's repetitive. So, it's possible to give the concern and the urgency when you put it on it. Yeah, fair enough. Any other questions for Jess or Todd? Yeah. We're, uh, well, that's all right. So after going through this entire process, have there been any other previous assessments that come to mind where uh, that's noted as something to revisit on uh, an assessment for another project? Hmm, that's a good question. I'm sure that there are. I mean, so Susan so talked about bias. You know, I come with North Springfield is my bias. So I've I came from New England District. I've worked on North Springfield since our periodic assessment. So I have biases on that. And there were things that I thought should be looked at and we felt that and we did that in the risk assessment. Um, so every district really has their projects of things that they think need to be looked into and have been recommended to look into some projects. So I think it's probably pretty common. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's a, I don't know if anyone knows what the landslide log is, the CHU supported uh, landslide data bath base, and there's been two or three massive scale wedge type structural, wedge type failures in the Himalaya, I think up in Alaska, huge, this scale size thing that have been just triggered by increasing snow melts and runoffs or, or just natural, you know, port pressure increases, and, and that's, that's how slopes like to go. They like to go downhill. <laughs> and so that was also a little bit of a, a interesting finding over last year. And we use that as well in our argument that, that these are not, they're not super unusual. And then Jess also did a pretty good study on triggered rock slides. And we started seeing what sort of trigger mechanisms from seismic. Yep, and that's how distances we... and ground accelerations and magnitudes, and we coupled all that together. And there's quite a number of rock slides triggered by large earthquakes. Right, right. Yep. So all that coupled together also made the argument of the compelling issues. Yeah, yeah it helped us build our threshold of seismic events to look at, or kind of what we would think we would need to be able to do that. Any other questions? So as I mentioned, um, thanks, Jess and Todd. Thank